The following is a lecture given by His Holiness Jaya Bhattaka Swami on September 23rd, 1984. The class begins with a reading from the Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita, Maji Leela, chapter 14, verse 45. Kangalera bhojan rango deki gaura hari Hari bola bola Hari bola boli tare upadesha kori Kangalera bhojan rango deki gaura hari Hari bola boli tare upadesha kori Translation Observing the beggars eating prasad, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu chanted, Hari and instructed them to chant the holy name. Translation Observing the beggars, observing the beggars eating prasada, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu chanted, and instructed them to chant the holy name purport in a song Srila Bhakti Vinod Thakur chants Miche Mayada Bose Jacho Bhese Kacho Habu Thubu Bhai Jiva Kishno Dasa E Vishwasa Kori Leitara Dukkonai Translation Everyone is captivated by the waves of the ocean of nations. But if everyone would immediately accept Lord Sri Krishna as their eternal master, there would be no chance of being carried away by the waves of illusion. Then all the sufferings would stop. End of translation. Krishna conducts the material world under the three modes of material nature. And consequently, there are three platforms of life, higher, middle, and lower. On whatever platform one may be situated, one is tossed by the waves of material nature. Someone may be rich, someone may be middle class, and someone may be a poor beggar. It doesn't matter. As long as one is under the spell of the three modes of material nature, he must continue to experience these divisions. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu therefore advised the beggars to chant Hari while taking prasad. Chanting means accepting oneself as the eternal servant of Krishna. This is the only solution regardless of social position. Everyone is suffering under the spell of maya. Therefore, the best course is to learn how to get out of the clutches of Maya. That is the verdict of the Bhagavad Gita 14.26. Mancha yogya vicharina bhakti yogena sevati sagunan samati chaitan Brahma Bhuhaya Kalpate Translation One who engages in full devotional service, who does not fall down in any circumstance, at once transcends the modes of material nature and thus comes to the level of Brahman, 
Unquote. One can overcome the spell of Maya and attain the transcendental platform by agreeing to engage in the devotional service of the Lord. Devotional service begins with Sravanam Kirtanam. Therefore, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu advised the beggars to chant the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra for elevation to the transcendental position. On the transcendental platform, there is no distinction between the rich, the middle class, and the poor. Thus end the Bhaktivedanta purport of the Chaitanya Charitamrita verse 45, chapter 14, Madhya Lila, in the matter of the performance of the Vrindavana pastimes. Lord Chaitanya had ordered the Govinda, his personal servant, to call all of the poor beggars you see, who are very unhappy due to their poverty. And on Lord Chaitanya's instruction, all these beggars were sumptuously fed Krishna Prasad. While they were taking Krishna Prasad, Lord Chaitanya told them all to chant the Harinam, chant the names of Krishna, by calling out to them, Hari Bol, Hari Bol, chant the names of Hari, chant the names of Hari. So all the beggars they began to chant. Similarly, in uh, Mayapur, when we distribute prasadam, at that time we ask all the people to chant. And you can hear the uh, thousands of people, they'll all stop to ta- taking prasad for a moment, and they'll start to chant, Hari Bol, Hari Bol, Gauri! Or before taking prasadam, they'll chant, Hare Krishna. Then we give everyone prasad. So, this is our basic program to feed people prasadam and to ask them to chant Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. Maya, or the illusion, is that we think we can be happy by following the different programs for happiness provided by the three modes of material nature. By the mode of ignorance, we may think that we can be happy by insanity, by suicide, by destroying something, or becoming very angry, bitter, jealous, envious, and so on. By the mode of passion, we feel we can be happy by profit, by accumulation, by fame, fortune, and so on. And by the mode of goodness, we feel we can be happy through cleanliness, religiosity, charity, kindness, and then you have the mixtures of those three. But all of the various programs provided by the three modes of material nature, they do not offer the satisfaction we are looking for to achieve real satisfaction in life. There has to be the transcendental connection with Krishna. Miche maya la bose jacho beshe kacho habudu bubai. We are in the midst of the ocean of Maya and we are floating on the waves of Maya. The different types of waves are like the different types of material situations, material allurements, material happinesses. But just as one is uplifted by a wave, next minute one is thrown down by the wave. So, kacho, habudubu bhai. That here we are in this material ocean. Sometimes the wave is lifting us up, sometimes it's crashing us down. 
In this way we're forced to drink the salty waters. We're forced to accept this plummeting and beating by the waves of material world. So, another verse is there in Chaitanya Charitamrita. Kabu nana kadu kabe sarga utai kabu nana kadu bai danda jana raja jana nadi te chubai. Sometimes we are brought up to heaven to enjoy happiness like the demigods. Sometimes we are taken down to hell, to a hellish existence, to experience the suffering like the suffering in the animal species and lower. So, dunking arrangement where sometimes we are giving a little relief, sometimes we are given some relief, sometimes we are put into extreme anxiety and suffering. Normally people who get a little material happiness, they become a little proud. As a result, that makes them not very interested in spiritual life. Especially since the kings were the symbol of material happiness in the Rajaguna. Rajaguna is named after Raja's passion. The name of our king is Raja. So, practically it's synonymous. To be the head of government, especially to be an absolute monarch, can provide unlimited facility for power, sense gratification, enjoyment of the senses. Apart from all the other responsibilities that come with it, there's an ample facility for enjoyment. So if a king or executive head had the objective to try to lead his life in a God-conscious way and to have the kingdom be uh, spiritually aware, that was considered to be something very glorious. And they were known as Rajarshi. Simultaneously they were Raja and Rishi. Raja is king and Rishi means wise sage. So the sadhus though, they would avoid the grossly materialistic kings. And so sometimes they would test. For instance, when Maharaj Pratap Rudra tried to get the audience of Krishna Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, Lord Chaitanya refused him. He said that, how can I associate with you through messengers? You are a king. You are involved in politics, sense gratification and so on. So for a mendicant in the renounced order, it's not good to associate with two materialistic a person. But Pratap Rudra Maharaj, when Lord Chaitanya saw him sweeping the road for Lord Jagannath in Puri, although he was a king, he was accepting the most humble position as a servitor, as even a street sweeper for Lord Jagannath. In fact, this had impressed Lord Chaitanya very much. The sweeping of the street for Lord Jagannath is not a new thing. But it's been performed for thousands and thousands of years. The King Indra Dumna, he also swept the road for Lord Jagannath thousands and thousands of years ago. In fact, Indra Dumna was engaged to marry another princess, another king. But when that king saw that he was sweeping the road, he wasn't a very Krishna conscious king, he refused according to the histories given in Orissa, he refused to allow his daughter, the princess, to be married to King Indraduma. He forbade that my daughter will never marry a street sweeper. In India, sweepers are considered to be 
Of course, there, you see, they don't have a municipal sewage system. Sometimes it's manually cleaned, and the sweepers do that job. So traditionally, the sweepers have been considered to be the depressed class. They do not always follow all the hygienic systems, or even if they do, due to their occupation, the aroma and other things which accompany them are such that people generally keep a healthy distance. So somehow they also get the job of sweeping the streets, although that's not quite as despicable an occupation. But alongside the streets, the gutters, sometimes in the older municipalities, they serve for the open-air sewage system. So it more or less kind of merges in more ways than one. So, of course, to clean the road before Lord Jagannath is not a material duty. And to have lumped in King Indradumna as a, such a sweeper, not seeing that actually he was a great devotee of Lord Jagannath. And for Jagannath, he can take any role and that as a devotional service offered to Krishna, whether sweeping or whether doing arti or whatever it may be, it's all absolute on the transcendental platform. So, Indra Dumna, he felt that it was actually more than a, a matter just of insulting him. It was an insult to Lord Jagannath that it was a lack of appreciation of the transcendental position of Lord Jagannath. So he declared war upon that king. Willingly or unwillingly, he was going to marry his daughter. It's a matter of war. He was going to die in the battle. But the other king was very powerful. So there was some doubt as to whether he would be victorious or not. The Pujaris and, uh, of Jagannath Puri Temple, they, they say that Indra Dumna did a great puja for Lord Jagannath, Krishna. And he went off. Of course, in his mind he was wondering whether in fact he would be victorious or not. But as a matter of principle, he wasn't going to take any kind of even indirect insult against Lord Jagannath or his devotional service. So, in front of Lord Jagannath's army, there were two generals, according to the legend, the history, who were riding to scout the situation. And these two generals, they stopped one lady who was carrying some yogurt to the market and said that, give us your yogurt. We are hungry. So I'm very poor. What will you pay me? So we don't have any money. Then how will I be paid? The king Indra Dumna, he'll pay you. He's coming. He won't uh, pay any attention to me. Who am I? I'm a simple village woman. If I try to see him, I won't get any, any, any audience whatsoever. They said, no, you can take this ring. You show this ring to him and he will give you ample reward. So she accepted the ring from one of the generals, gave the yogurt, they went on. So then, when she came, she wanted to see the king. Big cavalry procession, all, all battle array elephants. Here's a humble woman wants to see the king. And everyone said, get away. And he said, no, no, so I have this ring. Some commotion on the side, the king saw. What is that? What is it? Bring her here. What does she want? So she said that you are to reward her for she's given yogurt to some of your generals. He says, what? All my generals are here. No, there were two generals and they came and they took my yogurt and they gave me this ring. And they said, well, what? They saw that ring. He said, this is Jagannath's ring. What did those generals look like? One was very black and he was riding a white horse and the other one was pure white and he was riding a black horse and they were both very young and very powerful looking and described. And then, you know, Indra Dhamna Maharaj became completely ecstatic. He said, 
It was Jagannath and Balaram. Then they knew that their expedition would be completely successful. So, like this, there are so many histories of how the Lord has given His mercy to His devotees. The, of course, He was victorious, and that daughter became His queen, that princess. And the other king later could recognize what was the real value of devotional service. So Lord Chaitanya, he also tested the King Pratap Rudra. But when he saw him sweeping the road and doing so many devotional services, his heart softened to him. In Navadeep, Jayadev took his birth about a thousand years ago. At that time, Lakshman Sen, I can't remember if it's Lakshman Sen or Malal Sen. One's the father, one's the son. Two great kings. I think, I think with Jayadeva it was Lakshman Sen, but I'm not 100% sure. Could have been Balal Sen. Sena. Of the Sena dynasty. Anyway, take it as Lakshman Sen. Went to see uh, Jayadeva to request him to become his minister. To become the king, the royal poet, the royal... For the whole kingdom, the, the poet, because Jayadeva was such a great poet, Vaishnava, he came with his ministers and Jayadeva became very angry because here he was the Brahmana and his residence was being intruded by a king. He began to chastise the king. He said that I'm leaving Navadip. I refuse to reside here. Because the king has come here and polluted my residence. King who is, kings are always involved in so much materialistic activity. So, I'm leaving. I'm very offended. But then, Lakshman Sen, he paid his obeisances to Jayadev and he pleaded that please don't leave my kingdom that uh, I meant no offense. Yes, this royal order is such a despicable occupation. We have to be involved in so many undesirable activities to protect the country. So, if you leave our kingdom, then it will be a great loss. So kindly don't, uh, you've given your word, I know you can't break it. So don't leave my kingdom. Please take your residence just across the Ganges River. Jayadeva was living just near our temple. Just near the Sri Maya Pachandra Dayamandir. He requested to stay across the river. This is another proof that the original Navadip was on our side of the river. Because at that time he said to take his uh, residence across the river. So that at least you'll be within our kingdom. Otherwise, if we lose the association of such a great Vaishnava in our kingdom, this will be very unfortunate, inauspicious for everyone. We want the blessings of the Vaishnavas. Only for that purpose did I come to you, to request you to use your knowledge for the upliftment of the entire kingdom. So Jayadev, Seeing by testing, by a little criticism and seeing that he didn't get angry and puffed up, but actually he became humble. You could see actually he was a devotee, not just a materialistic king who wanted to exploit him for his own name and fame. So then Jayadev said that, all right, I'll live across the river and you can also come and see me, but don't come as a king. Come in ordinary dress, like a Brahmana, the Vaishnava, you come and see me in secret, and we can discuss Krishna Kota. So, like this, there were some tests given by Lord Chaitanya, by others, because people sometimes, when they're rich or powerful, they, they want to use uh, the church or the religious people to the religious issues for their political power. 
They don't actually, they're not interested in spiritual life. The pure devotees, they don't appreciate that. But they did appreciate it if a king actually was a devotee, if he was a Rajarshi. So, here, people, when they get wealthy, sometimes they become very proud. Sometimes in Sankirtan, the devotees find that even the poorer people, although they don't have much money, but generally they're easier to get them to stop or to discuss or to be receptive, but they don't have the capacity to give much. They're very wealthy businessmen. They tend to shove aside the preachers. Become very hard, cold. So that just means that their wealth will very soon be depleted. As soon as their pious activities run out, then again they can fall back down. So here these poor beggars have been invited to take prasad, to take Lord Jagannath's sacred food. So how fortunate they were. Although they don't have any money, but they're able to eat Krishna's prasad. That means that their spiritual good fortune has been made. And then Lord Chaitanya wants to give them even more good fortune. He's telling all of them to chant, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. So, whether one is rich or poor or middle class, everyone can chant the holy name of Krishna. They can achieve the transcendental platform. And on that transcendental platform, there's no distinction between the rich, the middle class and the poor. If someone tries to bring his distinction onto the uh, transcendental platform, rather that becomes an obstacle. You see, So just that the rich, they wouldn't try to use their material accumulation of wealth as some kind of a qualification to achieve God consciousness. That, that's not a qualification. The qualification is to chant Hare Krishna, to take Krishna prasadam, to serve the devotees of the Lord, to be humble. The easiest way to get over the attachment to wealth is to see that the real proprietor of the wealth is Krishna. If we see that Krishna is the proprietor, then even a wealthy person is not uh, wealthy in the, that sense. He won't be proud because he'll say, well, it's actually Krishna's property. I'm a trustee. Actually, in India, this was a system that many of the rich landowners, the landlords, the zamindars, they would put their entire property in the name of the deity. They call it Devattar. And the deity was the proprietor. And they would manage the estate of the deity as a Savite, as a servant. And they would get a house, and they get their prashadam of the deity and their clothing, but everything was in the name of the deity, neither could it be sold had to be managed in that way. And then all the profits from that property held as a debutter, as a deity estate, would be used for having fabulous Janmashtami festivals, Gaur Purnima festivals, Julan festivals, Ras Lila festivals, so that in the villages, in the cities, you'd find that throughout the year, There'd be income coming to the deity's fund from the rent on the land, and there'd be these fabulous festivals going on. And the, the, the Jamandars, they'd get a great happiness uh, building a little temple like Ras Buddy, a special temple just to take the deity for Ras Lila festival. They take the deity, and all the devotees would dance around, around, and chant Hare Krishna around the deity throughout the night for Ras Lila, <coughs> Jula. Swing festival, so on. Now, unfortunately, must be due to some offenses on the part of those Sayvites, for one reason or another. Most of the Devattars or these estates are due to the demonic influence of the government. After the British left, a socialistic uh, trend in India, 
they became envious of the deities, they had so much property. So instead of making a system whereby these estates could be run for the social benefit, instead they said, no, these people are misusing the name of deity worship, they're, they're avoiding tax. So they took away all the deity's property and gave the deity a token payment. They definitely could have made some other arrangement, but actually they were some people were envious of the deity worship. So as a result, now these big festivals are not so gorgeously performed in, uh, as, as, in as regular a manner as they had been in the past. And some of these big temples built up by the uh, Jamindars, they come to us to say, please take them over, we can't maintain. Because there's no estate, they have no land. The government gives them $50 a year, a month to maintain this huge uh, building. It's nothing. So, anyway, the point is that on the transcendental platform, there's no distinction between rich, middle, or poor. And that if even a wealthy man actually, so long he takes everything to be the property of Krishna, then he can remain in a very... Those zamindars, they were very happy. According to history, they were... Many great uh, devotees of Lord Chaitanya were these uh, landlords. Raghunath Das Goswami was a jamindar. Uh, Shivananda Sena might have been. Definitely Pundarik Vidyanidhi was a jamindar. And there are many other. Vasudev Dr. He was a jamindar. In this way, even though they were wealthy, they were almost like kings, but they put the whole a small kingdom or more like dukes or counts in the European context. They put everything in the name of the deity. It was The whole area was in trust and the actual landlord was the deity. One had to pay. Recently in Orissa, this system is still there. There are literally thousands and thousands of tenants on Lord Jagannath's land. The one time they decided to stop paying they said that no, we won't. We won't pay Jagannath his rent, his share. They're supposed to pay one third of all the crops to the temple, and they they stopped to do so. And as a result, the temple was put in some great difficulty. The people they started to preach some atheism that now if Jagannath wants, let him come and they get it. This that you know some communistic kind of influence or something came there. He's the Lord of everything, he doesn't need it. We've been working it, it's ours. You might remember about ten years ago, came in the paper, there was a tropical storm took form in the Bay of Bengal, off of Jagannath Puri, when this uh, movement was going on. And the huge tidal waves struck Jagannath Puri and salt water and sand completely covered all the land of Jagannath where these people were refusing to pay rent and it became completely useless. Well, there was a lot of soul searching after that. <laughs> so, of course that's another side of it. We shouldn't take a responsibility from God and then try to cheat Him and not expect to get the short end of the deal. But if we rather take the opportunity to serve Him, to chant His holy name, then this suffering that is there in the material world, that ends. Jiva Krishna Das, E Vishwash. We should have the faith, the very deep conviction and belief that we are in fact the servant of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. We are the servant of Krishna. Korelita ar dukkhunai. When we have that deep conviction, then that material suffering which uh, normal karmis have to endure, that hopeless and helpless situation, that suffering is no longer uh, experienced. As we advance in Krishna consciousness, the suffering goes. All the sufferings would stop. Korlita ar dukkhunai. No more suffering. Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, when he's asking them, feeding them Krishna Prasad, asking them to chant, this is a complete 
giving them their material need, giving them their spiritual upliftment, which in turn will stop all their material sufferings. Therefore, this welfare work that he's giving them is complete. It doesn't leave any stone unturned. It doesn't leave any area undeveloped. All the sufferings, their disease, their uh, old age, the death, rebirth, adidaivik, adibhotik, adiatmik, suffering from natural calamity, from others, living, other living entities, from their own body and mind, all these things are uh, stopped as one completely surrenders unto Krishna. That's the only solution, regardless of one's social position. So, in our Rathyatra festival, we also inviting people to take prasadam, to chant Hare Krishna, and that is the real medicine. <clears throat> we were discussing this morning that uh, here in Atlanta, often we go different places with Harinam, trying to get the people to come to our temple. We are discussing how coming to the temple is for very, very fortunate people to have the darshan of Nittai Gaur chant and Jagannath is not a small thing. We have to be quite fortunate to come in a temple, a very powerful and sacred temple where Prabhupada and these very powerful deities reside. It's for very fortunate people. And that many people, they may not have the requisite good fortune to avail of this uh, mercy. You see, sometimes the devotees give them that good fortune by inviting them to come and they may come out of curiosity or out of desire for knowledge or out of distress or out of economic desire. But if we encourage them, as Lord Chaitanya here is encouraging all these uh, poor beggars to chant Hari Bol, if we can give them some prasadam, also request them to chant Hare Krishna. If we present it in such a way that they can see that they can chant Hare Krishna in their house, they don't have to change their American way of life. They can, you know, which they're very attached to. They can chant the Maha Mantra in their closet, in their living room in their house, in the park, while they're jogging. They can chant Hare Krishna. Then, well, by chanting, we have a lot of home chanters. Then they'll be able to get the good fortune to come to the temple and to appreciate fully the mercy of Lord Chaitanya, Lord Jagannath. So many people are doing these different forms of meditation that are being sold in the market for a good price. Somehow, we, now we need preachers to be dedicated devotees to spread this movement. But we want to spread it to the mass of people. We want them to get this good fortune. Just as Lord Chaitanya was giving prasadam and telling the beggars to chant Hari Bol. So, practically speaker, speaking, they may be materially not beggars. Spiritually, most of the population is bankrupt. They're beggars. They don't have any spiritual asset. They have no spiritual conception of life. They're suffering with habudubus. The suffering of the mlechas and javanas is so great that practically it's overwhelming to see the suffering in their face. Despite of having money, they're so frustrated, trying to enjoy the senses. They're broken homes and addictions and different problems there. Struggle to maintain the status quo in the ever-changing waves and throes of this material ocean of birth and death. They're breaking practically every conceivable law of nature and then trying to maintain the equilibrium while karma is completely against them is a very terrifying predicament for them. You can see the result in so many untimely deaths, so many accidents and cancers and diseases and political upheavals, and mental disorders, broken relationships. 
the people are suffering in so many ways. In spite of economic development being rampant, spiritual development is uh, practically nil. Even religion has been prostituted for the sole purpose of economic development. And very little attempt is made to actually develop a personal relationship with God and His pure devotees. Rather, God is made as our order supplier. So, this is a very unfortunate position for these people because as a result, they are suffering in so many ways. Especially those who don't have any uh, religious faith at all. They're very unfortunate. So Lord Chaitanya, he called the beggars, he fed them, Krishna Prasad. Whether you're rich or poor, actually Krishna Prasad, we are all beggars for Prasad. In India, if you distribute Prasad, the wealthy people, they also come, but they say, just give us a kunika matcha, even a touch, a bit. They're not anxious to sit down and take a full plate, it's not... We may insist upon them, but if they get even a small piece, they're quite happy. Like our Chiradoi festival. If they get even a morsel of prasad, they're quite overjoyed. Even if we give people a small particle of prasad, it says even a drop, even a tiny bit, kunika, it's just a fragment of prasad. Kunika matta, only a small fragment of prasadam. It's enough to give them all the good fortune in their life to begin their spiritual life. And then on top of that, if they, by taking prasad, if that has given them enough fortune that they again can do this spiritual meditation of chanting the holy names. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. And Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadabha Sri Vasari Gaur Bhakta Vrinda. Well then, their spiritual life and is uh, well on its way and their sufferings are soon going to be uh, ended. So this is our objective. We want to somehow induce the people to take up the chanting and eating prasadam. And then Certainly they'll come here to the temple with great uh, respect and uh, appreciation for this uh, spiritual oasis here in this material ocean, this island of transcendental joy and peace and enlightenment. Jai Sri Krishna Chaitanya, Jai Nityananda Prabhu, Jai Jagannath Subhadra Baladev Ki Jagannath Radhyatya Mahamuhutsav Ki Any questions? Yes? Yes, you should have tried but you have acquaintances out there I've had a few friends that come to the temple and like give a like that they're not they're materially somewhat so-called happy they have a good job decent car nice place to stay so they're just float along and thinking everything's okay so I have Wondering what is a good technique to get them to change. What is a good technique? They're not so motivated. Well, probably the same techniques that people buy life insurance. Everyone knows that down the road there's difficulty, so they may not be so sincerely and in fact, heart. They won't necessarily. They won't be so sincerely chanting, or they won't be chanting so much from the core of their heart as a surrendered devotee who has given his everything to Krishna. But if they do chant, even just as a type of... Every person is an individual. You can present chanting in countless ways as a protection from danger, as an increasing of concentration and spiritual control of the mind. Without being able to control your mind, you have to preach to people. You won't get peace. Without peace, even if you have money, you can't be happy. So if a person chants Hare Krishna and is, learns this process of yoga, 
Every yoga is to control the mind and senses, unless they are able to bring the senses and mind under some sort of control, which is normally not possible, then they are going to be put into so much uh, difficulty. Why wait for trouble? You should already take some precautions. So by chanting, that protects one. In Dwaraka, there are so many people who are devotees of Krishna, but they live in a very opulent way. It's not that one has to, by being a devotee, change their standard of living, but rather they should uh, simultaneously begin to serve Krishna and gradually bring up their service to Krishna to that same standard. There's so many wealthy people there buying these courses. They're going to health spas, they're going to yoga clubs, they're paying for TM to make a course. Home yoga course, home meditation course, hundred dollars. Mantra is free, but we'll teach you how to chant, get it free, you know, give them a little kit. If we have to market here in America unless people pay for something. We can't charge for the mantra. We can charge for a course, how to set up a home yoga, home chanting or something. But somehow, by preaching, they should know that by chanting they'll get more a uh, peace of mind than by any other process. Not that immediately they have to give up everything. Rather they should just add the chanting and then gradually by association with devotees they'll learn how to utilize what they have in a more productive Krishna conscious way. We should definitely understand that, that we're not, that is definitely a much more uh, neophyte stage of devotional service. We're not offering it as an alternative for a devotee who is already absorbed in preaching, somebody who is in a higher level of dedication to Krishna, to try to keep up the same level of uh, productivity or of giving to Krishna. But this is for spreading it out, uh, the mercy, just like Lord Chaitanya is calling in the beggars and telling them to chant. So this is our distribution of mercy. In many ways, the rich people are suffering more because they don't have any information that uh, simply... By, they think that I'm wealthy. Why aren't I happy? Why am I still frustrated? I got a house. I got my car. I got my job. I got every... But still I'm not happy. They become alcoholics or they become something else. Because that's happiness is already within us. It's already there. These external things only bring in the very flickering material happiness. But the real permanent happiness is already within us, the satisfaction. We said to, to get to that, that is the process of bhakti yoga, that is the process of chanting and hearing. Then one feels fulfilled. Somehow, each person is an individual. Somehow, by, by any means, you should get them to be Krishna conscious. This is what Rupa Goswami said. Yena tena prakarena Krishna mana nivoshate By any means you get them to be attached to Krishna. You can't, you can't just, you know, it's not that it's a package, stereotype. Each person is an individual. It's by each person, by whatever means you can, you get them attached to Krishna. You get them to chant Hare Krishna. Then after that, once they made some advancement, when they, they, when they see that I could even, that the other devotees are even more happy, what to speak of what peace and happiness, the other devotees are more ecstatic. So how is it that I can, just like that one devotee who got the touchstone and he saw, well, I went to the devotee, I got what I wanted, but he, he must have something more valuable. Then you can introduce some of the higher to establish Krishna consciousness, Prabhupada needed brahmanas to preach. So he had to give the highest standard right from the very beginning. But he instructed that next stage is Varnashram. It has to be given to the total society. As whatever position they're in, they have to be trained how to become gradually Krishna conscious, how to use their occupation as a jumping board to go back to Krishna as a method of serving Krishna. It's not that our society is only for brahmanas, but brahmanas are the core, they're the ministers of religion, they're the preachers. All of you are the preachers, everything is dependent upon you. 
But it's not expected that everyone in the world will be able to come up to that standard. So we also, just like Lord Chaitanya called the beggars, gave them prasad, told them to chant, we are also calling all the people and somehow trying to involve them in this process of chanting and serving. And as they advance, then they can also utilize their energy for helping this Krishna conscious movement expand. And then you want to know how there will be temples in every town and village as the devotees are there in every town and village, they all pitch in and they'll build the, just like they built the churches in America in every neighborhood. In Atlanta there will be so many temples. Be so many, and every house will be a temple, not that we even need a lot of institutional temples, but we can train them also how to make their house into a temple. These temples are training centers where people can learn how to be Krishna conscious and then bring that in their local area. And the whole responsibility is on the Brahmin Vaishnava preachers to liberally distribute Krishna consciousness to the suffering souls. Tonight I wanted to start one program just to, as an experiment, Sunday Feast. I happen to have about a couple hundred Samskar Putra cards from Malaysia in English. So we thought that maybe we can ask the people at the end of my lecture how many like this chanting process and see, as we do in any other places, if anyone would agree to chant or try to chant every day one round of Hare Krishna. See if anyone... This is an experiment, see what type of response we get. And we will be pleasantly surprised. Although, for America, I would custom make the card a little differently than what it is, but uh, it's an experiment. It's all right. But that's our basic program. If we can somehow get the people to chant even a little bit every day, then their good fortune increases and increases. And this way they get absorbed in love for Krishna, even they didn't expect it. And then their total mentality gets transformed. We don't tell them in the beginning, if you chant Hare Krishna, your total outlook on life is going to change, then they won't chant. In India, there are many people that say, I'm not going to chant. If I chant, I'll become like you. <laughs> That's their fear. It's not that they have to become like us... Uh, externally, but internally it's a fact that there is a change when someone chants and their outlook on life takes on transcendental vision and they become peaceful and happy. We don't want everyone to uh, give up their work and live in a temple. We'd rather have them work and give uh, Lakshmi to the temple so that the preachers could concentrate more on book distribution and on educating the people at large in the principles of Krishna consciousness. So we don't have to utilize so much energy for fundraising, which at the present time is essential under the circumstances. It's better if we can, by direct preaching, have people as Vaishyas contribute to supporting the Brahmanical programs. That will be our strength. As time goes on, they're going to try to take away this uh, different kind of... Uh, fundraising avenues that we've discovered as the demons become more and more concerned with the Krishna consciousness uh, progress. So they're going to try in various ways, they're already trying, to stop uh, us. But if we have a very strong grassroots base, the people are congregational supporters and they contribute, well then there's nothing that they, anyone can do. That's what happened in England recently. They lost some court cases and uh, they can't do street San Kirtan anymore. It's been declared illegal. So, but now, in the meantime, they're forced to go to all their congregational members and each of the members have pledged to give a certain amount every month. It automatically goes from the bank account. Just like when you get your paycheck and they take off for Social Security, Income tax, Hare Krishna tax. Hare Krishna, it just comes right off. And the government gives a tax rebate to the temple for that. So they get 25, right now they're getting about 20,000 pounds per month. It's called covenant in 
direct donation that just goes right into their account. And the government gave them their first check of 8,000 pounds. 42% tax kickback in England. So they're trying to build it out so that they get 40,000 pounds and then from the government they'll be getting about 15, 16. So it turns out, oh, if they get 25, then they'll get a total of 40. Something like that. And that's enough to maintain the entire Bhaktivedanta manner, everything. Then all the devotees can just concentrate on other type of direct preaching festivals, but putting on displays and things. Yes? We were discussing about implementing this type of program and trying to figure out what would be the best way to go about it. Any suggestions from the president to continue this program? Well, the point is that you can't suddenly change. The way they can do it in England is there's two million Indians there, and about 90% of those donors are Indian community. An Indian community in England is much more conscious because there's so many of them that are able to keep a lot of their traditional values. But in America, a lot of, when they come over here, a lot of them are more on their own, and so they're they forget, in some cases, the kind of traditional values, but definitely the Indian community could be a source. But basically we have to, it may take a little longer here, we have to build up a congregation. That means, first of all, you have to have a lot, a lot of people chanting Hare Krishna out there. And then amongst those who chant Hare Krishna and become a little serious, who, who can recognize that they're they gain something from chanting, then they'll feel very uh, encouraged to to giving something to help the Hare Krishna movement. So it's a gradual program as we preach and find favorable people to to get their names. They they call this contact Sankirtan in in the West in the uh, Europe. There they also visit them trying to get them to take whole sets of books, Peshwar paintings, Indian rugs, things like that, that are different. But the ultimate issue is to get them to be a congregational member and even to pledge, according to their, not that we, pray, you know, according to their capability, whatever they feel. So, the FOCA program in England, they have a program where to be a more integrated folk member, a person gives a pledge. They don't put any amount. They say whatever, you fill in the blank. So some people give one pound, some people gave even up to 5,000 pounds. In those days it was $10,000, now it's only seven. So the basic thing is to get names and then to cultivate them on a very gradual basis that at least that they start to chant Hare Krishna. So we're discussing if we had some more brochures and things. What do you call those? When you, those little pamphlets, there's a name for that. Leaflet. Well, uh, but there's like a kind of a technical name they call them. The general public, you know, leaflet, but they said like a... Huh? No, no, it's like, a, almost like a, it's like within that advertising Propaganda business. Uh, Flyer? It's, like, it's, it's something like that, but it's something. It's only, huh? Advertisement? It's not a real catchy little name, but it's not publicly used. It's only used by those pamphlets. No, everyone knows pamphlet, brochure, flyer, you know. Anyway, you got the point. <laughs> we have a few of those that might help. And you'll see in the New Orleans Rathyatra, they bring their full. Uh, Rathiatra display, they have some really nice displays on reincarnation. I saw it in New York. They show how Thomas and Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson, President Adams, what's his name? John Adams, Benjamin Franklin, George Harrison, and we just, you know, more recently. But in the past, all those great American uh, figures, they really didn't have anybody there from Dixie. Carlo more research. Thoreau, is it? Where's Thoreau from? 
Massachusetts. It's the wrong state. Are they considered Yankees? Is Benjamin Franklin a Yankee or is he above that? He's accepted. Oh, <laughs> but that was before the Civil War, so does he. Uh... Huh? He's Virginia. Right, so Thomas Jefferson was known as one of, as a Brahmana. He believed in reincarnation, had discussion. Henry Ford said, when I was 26 years old, I accepted the principle of reincarnation. So they have all those quotes with pictures. So they, a few brochures like that might be helpful. They're going to get them to get the coming back uh, book. But uh, we can... Get many people to take up the chanting if they don't feel intimidated, then gradually they'll become more and more a part of our Krishna conscious movement. And they can be uh, engaged as supporters. And in this country you get a 100% tax exemption. In England they don't get any tax exemption for the donors. In India you only get 55%. But in America so far, thank Krishna, if a person donates to the Krishna conscious movement, they get a hundred to the church, to the society, they get a hundred percent tax exemption. It's a big incentive. Why pay Uncle Sam? Pay Krishna. And get spiritual benefit for that and help your help this great culture be spread. So it's not going to change overnight our devotional services but it's something that has to be built up very gradually. So many books have been distributed, so many favorable people are there. Now they have to be cultivated and encouraged to practice a few basic principles, just a few, just the principle of chanting, nothing else. And then after that, maybe cooking their own, you know, vegetarian prashana. But the main thing is just to get them to chant, get them somehow to be attached to Krishna through art, through culture, through. Whatever their interest is, whatever their common interest is with Krishna, let, through that interest try to get them attached to Krishna. And then from there, you see, once you have that beachhead, then you build on that. A little spark, you fan it, until they become more advanced in spiritual life. Those who are able to become full-time devotee, they're, they're already flaming. They're already effulgent. They're very, very fortunate people. So it says, out of thousands, one person is interested in spiritual life. And out of thousands, those interested, one person uh, practices the principles of spiritual life. And out of thousands of those, there's one person who realizes. And out of thousands of realize, someone's liberated. And out of thousands are liberated, and there's someone who's a pure devotee of Krishna. And if we can get people even just to be a little interested in spiritual life, just to chant, then they can very quickly come up to the perfectional platform. The basis is a book distribution, getting them to read Prabhupada's books, getting them to chant, getting them to take prasana. But Prabhupada said, the research work, we have to do research work, how to give the people Krishna consciousness. That is the real research work. It's a purport like that. The real research work is researching how to have the people become Krishna conscious. We can take inspiration from other places, but in this particular place, we have to research. It's like in Japan, there, there are ways to reach the people. It's not that they're unreachable. It's not that the people there are not innocent people in the world. Very few are actually out-and-out -out demons. General population are innocent. They don't know. In America, 99% of the people say they believe in God. But the attendance in organized religions is down very much. I mean, there's a lot of people that believe in God that don't have any religion, that don't have any real practice or method. A lot of people that may have religion, but they're not really doing it much. They could benefit, even in their own religion, by knowing these Krishna conscious techniques. They could become better Christians, better devotees of God. So, it's a great skull, but it requires some research work, some dynamic. Just as we're constantly researching how to improve our Sankirtan, where's a better line, a better place, a better method. Similarly, this is one other area of research which has to be developed.
not by everyone necessarily, but at least by someone in each temple, could concentrate, taking suggestions from the other devotees who may get some inspiration from Krishna. But that is also an important service which has to be developed along with... That's our future. That's the real future. That's what's going to change people's outlooks and to accept the Krishna conscious movement as a actual culture, a religion, not as something negative. Is when more and more people chant Hare Krishna. Just like people come up to my mother because she chants Hare Krishna now, although she still believes she's a Christian. She doesn't feel she's given up Jesus or anything. And they come and then she says, well, my son's a Hare Krishna devotee. And then they say, oh, we sympathize with you. <laughs> I said, no, it's quite good. I mean, he's doing a lot of good work. I said, really? And then, you know, because here someone says that, oh, no, it's, it's good work. This, then people, oh, well, this is very interesting. They're used to just hearing, you know, you know, another, my, you know, because it's a regular thing, I guess. Parents who say that my son has joined this group or that group, my daughter. When they find someone like that, middle age, no, this is doing good work, you know, it's quite nice. Oh, yeah, I, st I stay there in the center. That's the one that really knocks them over. <laughs> he said, well, we didn't know if you could come out after a certain time. You think I am a prisoner? <laughs> you know, people have all these strange ideas. She tells me all this. Why don't you come over? Are we allowed? <laughs> Even in India, this, I, this, some people think that it's all secret. You can't go inside the Hare Krishna temple. He says, no, it's open for everyone. In Sweden, they have school groups come. It's become, because they don't, they have actual buses every day. Two, three, four, five buses come to their temple at Krishna's Garden to see the deities, just yesterday there were two classes at Loyola University in New Orleans, uh, Friday and Thursday, where the devotees went and gave a comparative religion class uh, lecture. But here, even in America, and if you just like we had a Sunday feast, a few college groups came here. In the future, as we get more and more acceptance amongst the people, then School groups will come just to see little Indian culture, show them a video, show them so the day. This is the system, same system. And when they gave the lecture, somebody said they didn't believe, you know, in this, uh, you know, they started to oppose, saying, you mean you believe that that deity can speak? But the other people, they didn't, they were very supportive. They said, well, yes, if, we're, if you're that pure, you can hear the deity, the deity can speak to you. And they said that actually most of the students, they, they appreciate it, they could understand. Rabble rousers didn't get any support, so they kind of faded out. So this, we just have to continue through our Harinam, through our book distribution, through our different programs, getting more and more exposure. And as people get association, and as we provide them systems also they, that they, they can chant, and they can themselves practice even the basic principle of chanting Hare Krishna and reading Prabhupada's books, taking a little prasadam, then their hearts will gradually be changed. You think that their sinful attachments are more powerful than Krishna? The point is that they're avoiding Krishna. They're avoiding. They're using their economic development, their material culture, even their religion, everything to avoid God. They know that this, this is where you're directly performing. Many can sense that there's something very strong. In South America, I went to one of the monasteries and, and I went in this, and toured their little dispensary. The nurse said, it appears as if he's come just to take over. I'm just coming humbly, you know. But and one of the nuns came and said that when they heard that you were coming, so all the priests became afraid. So we never saw. He said that actually they're very afraid because they know that the Krishna conscious devotees know their philosophy of theology so well that nobody can stand up to them. 
the priest, actually literally they were shaking. There's no defense. Because we have whatever is in the Bible, we know it even better than they do. Plus, we're actually practicing. They know that you're practicing. They're not doing. This nun says, if you knew what went on, says there's not one priest or one nun that's celibate or does anything as far as I know in my life. That's what she said. But I can't believe, you know, that means she may be exaggerating, but she said that they all got some scam. There's not anybody that she knew that was, you know, together. That's why they're afraid. Because Hare Krishna devotees, even a simple devotee, they practice what they preach. They practice what is given in the Shastra. So just by association, even on the ecumenical level, will force the ministers of religion and the preachers to become more sincere, to bring up the standard in, in uh, God consciousness. Already, if you read these books, like uh, The Plain Truth, and that you'll see many of Prabhupada's arguments being used in those books now. Some ministers have admitted that they're reading our Back to Godhead and, and our books before they give their sermon. And using those arguments, they're giving their sermon. Where is a better source of spiritual understanding? So, we have to continue giving Prabhupada's literature out and then inducing people, encouraging them to take up the chanting, do some service. Nitai Gaur will do the rest. Nitai Gaur Pemani Hari Hari Hari